Chapter 8, The Pit. I cannot possibly describe to you what it felt like to be standing alone in the pitchy blackness of that silent wood in the small hours of the night. The sense of loneliness was overwhelming. The silence was as deep as death, and the only sounds were the ones I made myself. I tried to keep absolutely still for as long as possible to see if I could hear anything at all. I listened and listened. I held my breath and listened again. I had a queer feeling that the whole wood was listening with me. The trees and the bushes, the little animals hiding in the undergrowth, and the birds roosting in the branches all were listening. Even the silence was listening. Silence was listening to silence. I switched on the torch. A brilliant beam of light reached out ahead of me like a long white arm. That was better. Now at any rate, I could see where I was going. The keepers were all, would also see. But I didn't care about the keepers anymore. The only person I cared about was my father. I wanted him back. I kept the torch on and went deeper into the wood. Dad, I shouted. Dad, it's Danny. Are you there? I didn't know which direction I was going in. I just went on walking and calling out, walking and calling. And each time I called, I would stop and listen, but no answer came. After a time, my voice began to go all trembly. I started to say silly things like, oh, dad, please tell me where you are. Please answer me. Please, oh, please. And I knew that if I wasn't careful, the sheer hopelessness of it all would get the better of me and I would simply give up and lie down under the trees. Are you there, Dad? Are you there? I shouted. It's Danny. I stood still listening, 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 and in the silence that followed I heard, or thought I heard, the faint but oh so faint sound of a human voice. I froze and kept listening. Yes, there it was again. I ran towards the sound. Dad! I shouted. It's Danny. Where are you? I stopped again and listened. This time the words came just loud enough for me to hear the words. I'm over here, the voice called out. Over here. It was him. I was so excited. My legs began to get all shaky. Where are you, Danny? My father called out. I'm here, Dad. I'm coming. With the beam of the torch shining ahead of me, I ran towards the voice. The trees were bigger here and faced farther apart. The ground was a carpet of brown leaves from last year and was good to run on. I didn't call out any more after that. I simply dashed ahead, and all at once, his voice was right in front of me. Stop, Danny, stop, he shouted. I stopped dead. I shone the torch over the ground. I couldn't see him. Where are you, Dad? I'm down here. Come forward slowly, but be careful. Don't fall in. I crept forward. Then I saw the pit. I went to the edge of it and shone the light downward, and there was my father. He was sitting on the floor of the pit, and he looked up into the light and said, Hello, my lar marvelous darling. Thank you for coming. Are you all right, Dad? My ankle seems to be broken, he said. It happened when I fell in. The pit had been dug in the shape of a square, with each side about six feet long, but it was the depth of it that was so awful. It was at least 12 feet deep. The sides had been cut straight down into the earth, presumably with a mechanical shovel, and no man could have climbed out of it without help. Does it hurt? I asked. Yes, he said. It hurts a lot. But don't worry about it. But the point is, I've got to get out of here before morning. The keepers know I'm here, and they're coming back for me as soon as it gets light. Did they dig the hole to catch people? I asked. Yes, he said. I shone my light around the top of the pit and saw how the keepers had covered it over with sticks and leaves and how the whole thing had collapsed when my father stepped on it. It was kind of a trap hunter's dig to catch it was kind of a trap hunters in Africa dig to catch wild animals. Do the keepers know who you are? I asked. No, he said. Two of them came and shone a light down on me, but I covered my face with my arms and they couldn't recognize me. I heard them trying to guess. They were guessing all sorts of names, but they didn't mention mine. Then one of them shouted, We'll find out who you are, all right, in the morning, my lad. And guess who's coming with us to fish you out? I didn't answer. I didn't want them to hear my voice. We'll tell you who's coming, he said. Mr. Victor Hazel himself is coming with us to say hello to you. And the other boy said, Boy, I hate to think what he's going to do when he gets his hands on you. They both laughed, and then they went away. Ouch, my poor ankle. Have the keepers gone, Dad? 
yes, he said. They had gone for the night. I was kneeling on the edge of the pit. I wanted so badly to go down and comfort him, but that would have been madness. What time is it? he asked. Shine the light down so I can see. I did as he asked. It's ten to three, he said. I must be out of here before sunrise. Dad, I said. Yes, I brought the car. I came in the baby Austin. You what? he cried. I wanted to get here quickly, so I just drove it out of the workshop and came straight here. He sat there staring at me. I kept the torch pointed to one side of him so as to not dazzle his eyes. You mean you actually drove here in the baby Austin? Yes. You're crazy, he said. You're absolutely plumb crazy. It wasn't difficult, I said. You could have been killed, he said. If anything had hit you in that little thing, you'd have been smashed to smithereens. It went fine, Dad. Where is it now? Just outside the wood on the bumpy track. His face was all puckered up with pain and as white as a sheet of paper. Are you all right? I asked. Yes, he said. I'm fine. He was shivering all though. He was shivering all over though. It was a warm night. If we could get you out, I'm sure I could help you to the car. I said. You could lean on me and hop on one leg. I'll never get out of here without a ladder. He said. Wouldn't a rope do? I asked. A rope? He said. Yes, of course. A rope would do it. There's one in the baby Austin. It's under the back seat. Mister Pratchett always carries a tow rope in case of a breakdown. I'll get it, I said. Wait here, right there, Dad. I left him and ran back to, back the way I'd come, shining the torch ahead of me. I found the car. I lifted up the back seat. The tow rope was there, tangled up with the jack and the wheel brace. I got it out and slung it over my shoulder. I wriggled through the hedge and ran back into the wood. Where are you, Dad? I called out. Over here, he answered. With his voice to guide me, I had no trouble finding him this time. I've got the rope, I said. Good. Now tie one end of it to the nearest tree. Using the torch all the time, I tried I tied one of the rope one end of the rope around the nearest tree. I lowered the other end down to my father in the pit. He grasped it with both hands and hauled himself up into a standing position. He stood only on his right leg. He kept his foot off the ground by bending his knee. Jeepers, he said. This hurts. Do you think you can make it, Dad? I've got to make it, he said. Is the rope tied properly? Yes. I lay on my stomach with my hands dangling down into the pit. I wanted to help him pull up as soon as he can, as he came within reach. I kept the torch on him all the time. I've got to climb this with my hands only, he said. You can do it, I told him. I saw his knuckles tighten as he gripped the rope. Then he came up, hand over hand, and as soon as he was within reach, I got hold of one of his arms and pulled for all I was worth. He came over the top head, edge of the pit, sliding on his chest and stomach, him pulling on the rope and me pulling on his arm. He lay on the ground, breathing fast and loud. You've done it, I said. Let me rest a moment. I waited, kneeling beside him. All right, he said. Now for the next bit. Give me a hand, Danny. You'll have to work most you'll have to do most of the work from now on. I helped him to keep his balance as we got up on to his one good foot. Which side do you want me on? I asked. On my right, he said. Otherwise you'll keep knocking against my bad ankle. I moved up close to his right side and he put both his hands on my shoulders. Go on, Dad, I said. You can lean harder than that. Shine the light forward so we can see where we're going, he said. I did as he asked. He tried a couple of hops on his right foot. All right, I asked him. Yes, he said. Let's go. Holding his left foot just clear on the ground and leaning on with both hands, he began to hop forward on one leg. I shuffled along beside him, trying to go exactly the speed he wanted. Say when you need a rest. Now, he said. We stopped. I've got to sit down, he said. I helped him to lower himself to the ground. His foot dangled help helplessly on the broken ankle, and every time it, slept, it touched the ground, he jumped with pain. I sat beside him on the brown leaves that covered the floor of the wood. The sweat was pouring down his face. Does it hurt terribly, Dad? It does when I hop, he said. Each time I hop, it jars it. He sat on the ground, resting for several minutes. Let's try again, he said. 
I helped him up and off we went. This time I put an arm around his waist to give him an extra support. He put his right arm around my shoulders and laid, leaned on me very hard. It went better that way, but boy was he heavy. My legs kept bending and buckling with each hop. Hop, hop, hop. Keep going, he gasped. Come on, we can make it. There's the hedge, I said, waving the torch. We're nearly there. Hop, hop, hop. When we reached the hedge, my legs gave away, and we both crashed to the ground. I'm sorry, I said. It's okay. Can you help me get through the hedge? I'm not quite sure how he and I got through that hedge. We crawled a bit, and I pulled a bit, and little by little we squeezed through and out on the other side onto the track. The tiny car was only 10 yards away. We sat on the grassy bank under the hedge to get a breather. His watch said it was nearly 4 o'clock in the morning. The sun would not be up for another two hours, so we had plenty of time. Shall I drive, I asked. You'll have to, he said. I've only got one foot. I helped him to hop over to the car, and after a bit of a struggle, he managed to get in. His left leg was doubled up underneath his right leg, and the whole thing must have been an agony for him. I got into the driver's seat beside him. The rope, I said. We left it behind. Forget it, he said. It doesn't matter. I started the motor and switched on the headlamps. I backed the car and turned it around, and soon we were heading downhill on the bumpy track. Go slowly, Danny, my father said. It hurts like crazy over the bumps. He had one hand on the wheel, helping to guide the car. We reached the bottom of the track and turned onto the road. You're doing fine, he said. Keep going. Now that we were on the main road, I changed into second gear. Rub her up again and go into third, he said. Do you want me to help you? I think I can do it, I said. I changed into third gear. With my father's hand on the wheel, I had no fear of hitting the hedge or anything else, so I pressed down hard on the accelerator. The speedometer needle crept up to 40. Something big with headlamps blazing came rushing towards us. I'll take the wheel, my father said. Let go of it completely. He kept the little car close to the side of the road as a huge milk lorry rushed past us. That was the only thing we met on the way home. As we approached the filling station, my father said, I'll have to go to the hospital for this. It must be set properly and then put into plaster. How long will you, how long will you be in the hospital? Don't worry. I'll be home before evening. Will you be able to walk? Yes. They fix a metal thing into the plaster. It sticks out under the foot. I'll be able to walk on that. Should we go to the hospital now? No, he said. I'll just lie down on the floor of the workshop and wait till it's time to call Doc Spencer. He'll arrange everything. Call him now, I said. No, I don't like waking doctors up at 4.30 in the morning. We'll call him at 7. What will you tell him, Dad? I mean, how about, how about it happened? About how it happened? I'll tell him the truth, my father said. Doc Spencer is my friend. We pulled into the filling station. I parked the car right up against the workshop doors. I helped my father to get out. Then I held him around the waist as I, he hopped, hop, hop the short distance into the workshop. Inside the workshop, he leaned against the tool bench for support and told me what to do next. First, I spread out some sheets of newspaper out over the oily floor. Then I ran to the caravan and fetched two blankets and a pillow. I laid one blanket on the floor over the newspaper. I helped my father to lie down on the blanket. Then I put the pillow under his head and covered him up with the second blanket. But the phone, put the phone down here so I can reach it, he said. I did as he asked. Can I get you anything, Dad? What about a hot drink? No, thank you, he said. I mustn't have a thing. I'm going to have an anesthetic soon, and you mustn't eat or drink anything at all before that. But you have to but you have something. Go and make yourself some breakfast and go to bed. I'd like to wait here till the doctor comes, I said. You must be dead tired, Danny. I'm all right, I said. I found an old wooden chair and pulled it up near him and sat down. He closed his eyes and seemed to be dozing off. My own eyes kept do closing too. I couldn't keep them open. I'm sorry about the mess I made of all of it, I heard him saying. I must have gone to sleep after that because the next thing I knew I heard was Doc Spencer's voice saying to my father, Well, my goodness me, William, what on earth have you been up to? I opened my eyes and saw the doctor bending down over my father. 
who was still lying on the floor of the workshop.